Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. Now, one indicator that the IMF is pushing with its reforms in Sri Lanka is the privatization of state assets, just like what we discussed uh, at the beginning of the program where Sri Lanka Telecom Omtel was put up for sale despite making uh, being a profit-making entity. Joining me now is the Emeritus Professor in Management at the London campus of Loughborough University, Professor Jeffrey Hodgson. He is also an author and uh, will release a new book titled The Wealth of a Nation, which will be published in September of this year. He joins me via Zoom from London, UK. Thank you very much, Professor, uh, for joining. Um, I really appreciate it. Now, first, uh, privatization and non-state involvement have been the unique selling point in Sri Lanka, uh, mainly because uh, of the involvement of the IMF. What exactly should we make of this? Is there a different pathway other countries have followed that benefited them? Yes, privatization can only work if it's properly regulated. We have many examples of failure to regulate privatized companies properly. And we have exa other examples where it's worked fairly well. So privatization is not a magic solution. You do need regulation to make it work. Uh, understood. Professor, uh, we see that the US dollar is crashing in many parts of the world and several countries are seeking different trading methods like the BRICS nations. Uh, should a country like Sri Lanka also consider changing the and uh, changing and adopting novel practices like that? Yes, there's a lot of discussion of things like cryptocurrencies, but I think as we say, the jury's out on whether they're workable. I think we have to, for the time being, work within the currency system we have, which means that many countries also are going to rely on the dollar. So I, I wouldn't see any quick solutions in this area. Absolutely. Professor, finally, uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit about your findings in your latest book uh, and the key lessons a country like Sri Lanka could learn from it? Yes, thank you. Um, my book is about how England or Britain became developed in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries. And what I emphasize in the book is several things, including the following. One is the importance of for finance and financial institutions and economic development. And th these are hard to build up, I know, in developing countries. And it took a long time in my country, but it's very important. It's also another thing is a state administration that works well including the rule of law. Again, it's easy to say and very difficult to do. But this, again, is something which developing countries have to look at carefully, which they're already doing so. But I know it's a hard job, and it shows in my country that it took a long time to build these things up. But developing countries can learn from the experience of other countries, even though sometimes the situation is very different. Absolutely. All right. We have to leave it at that. Thank you very much. That was the Emeritus Professor in Management at the London campus of Loughborough University, Professor Geoffrey Hodgson. Now, another area of focus of the IMF is its effort to meddle with our internal affairs a, um, is a, in establishing an anti-corruption process that will address key leakages in economies like Sri Lanka. Of course, yes, it's very true that Sri Lanka needs to work on curbing corruption, especially in the state sector. But how those laws are drawn should be in a manner that favours this nation. Last week, the parliament gave uh, its seal of approval for the new limited anti-corruption bill. And joining me now to get more information on this bill is the chairman of the committee appointed by the Minister of Justice in relation to this anti-corruption bill. is also the former Director General of the Commission to Investigate Allegations of Bribery and Corruption, President's Counsel Asar Jamana. Thank, thank you very much, sir, for your time. Uh, good to see you. Now, tell me, what would we see um, change in this landscape with the implementation of this anti-corruption bill. Uh, thank you very much, Mahesh, for raising those uh, very important issues. Uh, one of the key features in the new anti-corruption commission and the new anti-corruption bill is that the commission would be truly independent. For example, the commission will have a monitor independence. Uh, they have to prepare their estimates and submit to the parliament. And it is the parliament who would support those uh, estimates and provide funds from the treasury after consulting the Minister of Finance. That is number one. Number two, the commission would be truly independent and therefore they are entitled to recruit the best experts for the investigations. For example, uh, forensic auditors, forensic accountants, uh, forensic uh, uh, IT experts. Likewise, they can recruit those investigators. Those are very crucial. 
In addition to that, for the first time in our history, the commission uh, will be given powers for prevention. That means, they can look at any system in a government department and suggest to them that their system has to be changed, their procedures have to be changed for the purpose of eradicating bribery and corruption. Then uh, for the first time, we have included private sector bribery, then we have included conflict of interest. Uh, failure to give for conflict of uh, interest declaration is an offence. Then we will have uh, online asset declaration. The here and after asset declarations have to be submitted directly to the uh, bribery commission. They will verify the truthfulness of the asset declaration by being in touch with other government departments. So therefore, here and after it is not necessary for the public servants who are in the staff grade to submit their asset declaration manually. Even the politicians, even the president, the prime minister, the local government uh, uh, the representative, provincial, uh, provincial council representative, they have to give asset declaration and that is one of the key features uh, of the entire anti-corruption act. Uh, finally, uh, the whatever the uh, pending cases, whatever the pending investigation will be continued. Uh, in the transitional provision as per the previous law. So, those are the key features in the new uh, anti-corruption bill. Uh, uh, President's Council, one of the most uh, prominent accusations on this bill is that it doesn't address the efforts of catching the real perpetrators of corruption, but just catches the little guy. Your reactions? No, if you carefully examine, uh, you will understand it's a myth. If we are doing a job, it is not uh, uh, fitted with the international norms, what will happen? The, our work is being supervised by the UN ODC because we are a party to the UNCAC and during those review cycles, UNCAC, the UN ODC has recommended certain loopholes be filled immediately. So, whatever we do, we, are, we have been in touch with the UN ODC and the international community and our own experience. So, therefore, uh, this uh, bill will give more teeth for the investigators, more tea to the prosecutors. In addition to that, we have introduced uh, offences like conflict of interest, the private sector bribery and uh, we have introduced whistleblower protection uh, and we have given more powers for the investigators, use modern technology and we are in specific uh, new special methods. So, therefore, certainly uh, this is a new piece of law that would strengthen not only the independence, the efficiency of the, this thing would be in, uh, improved by introducing this act, we have never, we have never deleted whatever the legal provision with regard to the perpetrators in the act. In fact, uh, we are going to introduce as I said earlier, new asset, uh, new uh, electronic asset declaration system. So, we have tried our level best with our limitations uh, to a certain extent to give the best because when you introduce a law, one group would say this is not sufficient. Another group would say no, giving too much of power to the commission is not enough. Why? There can be arbitrary and capricious decisions that commission might be taken. So, so therefore, we have to uh, for safeguard those decisions. So, having regard to all the concerns of the all stakeholders uh, that uh, we have introduced, still we are open. If there are any amendments uh, that can be incorporated to the present bill, uh, I think government would be much happier uh, to incorporate uh, all these amendments. Understood. All right. Uh, we have to leave it at that. Uh, that was President's Council, Sarah Chairman, uh, on the new anti-corruption bill. Let's take a short commercial break. More State of the Nation right after this.